Great. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to our third meeting of the year for the Safe Water Advisory Group. Um, we have a pretty packed agenda, so we're going to try to move, the, move through things pretty quickly. Um, I think it would help to just do a quick round of introductions, both in the room and in person, so you know who's here. Uh, my name is Andrea Miko. I'm a Portsmouth resident and a co chair of the SWAG with Brian. And I'll pass it to Hi, I'm City Councilor Rick Blaylock, um, also a Portsmouth resident. Uh, Bill McQuillan, uh, Assistant Fire Chief and City Resident. Jonathan Natali, I'm a toxicologist at the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services, and I'm a guest today. Pat, Marcus Rush Manager for the City of Portsmouth. I'm Vince Lombardi, City Councilor. Brian Getz, Deputy Director of Public Works and Co Chair of the SWAG. Stephanie Secord, Public Information Officer and Minute Taker for SWAG. And then virtually, do we just have Laurel? Right now, yes. Okay, Laurel, if you want to introduce yourself. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Laurel Shader. I'm a senior scientist at Silent Spring Institute. Thank you so much. Thanks for keeping the Zoom option an option. <laughs> Well, glad that you're able to join us. Join us. Great. Um, and then, yeah, I know. Is there any meeting hybrid logistics for anyone online? We know Laurel's video is not working, but if she needs to ask a question, can she raise her hand, Brian? Or how do we um, make sure she's part of the discussion? In the room? She can yell. <laughs> I can yell. There is a raise hand okay. Okay. option. Yeah. Someone will notice. Okay. Great. All right. Um, uh, Sounds good. So I think the first thing that we need to do is approve our minutes from our April meeting, which was April 20th, uh, 2022. I sent out the minutes to everyone last week, I believe, or the week before. And so I think we just need a motion to uh, approve the minutes. So moved. Okay. Second. Okay, cool. And um, every, is everybody in favor of approving the minutes? Yes. 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 Is there any objections to approve, approving the minutes? Okay. All right. And so next, I uh, will turn it over to Brian to give us an update on the water forum, uh, the community water forum that we had in May here at the City Hall. Okay. Great. Oh, there we go. The yes, our packed agenda. Sorry. Um, but we've, we've got cues in the slide deck here to. Um, keep us moving along, and uh, Jonathan sent us his, so incorporated in your section. Um, so the drinking water forum seems like such a long time ago, but uh, May 3rd, um, we gathered, and um, it looks like just about everybody here, with the exception of Jonathan, was there. It was a, it was a, it was a good night. I think it went very well. Um, Thing moved along. We had a lot of slides that night too, and, and all the videos. And staff did a great job. Um, we have. Brian, the, the, me. it's not showing up on Zoom. It's not showing up on Zoom. Let's try this one. Yes. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> so um, the uh, the the whole. Um, Forum itself is uh, is on the city YouTube channel under the Safe Water Advisor Group, and then if you go to Think Blue, there's additional um, the the detailed uh, Al's slideshow on the sources of supply, Mason's water quality um, presentation, and, and stuff are on Zoom. But uh, I thought um, I would. There we go. Um, just the polling went pretty good, and I did a, a couple of select uh, um, answers and uh, kind of revisit some of the poll um, info, and it was uh, kind of revealing um, where people got their information and uh, city's website, our water quality report. Um, and of course, my favorite um, information was Al, Mark, Mason, and Tim. So Mark, Mark Young, our uh, the chief operator, Tim Green, our water foreman, and Mason Caceres, our water quality person. So uh, um, you know, good insight there. Um, it was nice to see that, um, for the most part, people were more confident after attending. Um, but we do have two that um, 
we're, we're not. So I guess we got to keep working at it and uh, we'll uh, see what we can do in future years if we have more forums. Um, but just about everybody, at least um, one person thought it was somewhat useful, but um, everybody that attended thought it was worth the time. So really appreciate that. It's good. And, and um, would you like to attend additional meetings on this? Um, you know, again, pretty positive response to that. 75% yes, and uh, a few maybe. So um, but for the night, um, really good. The format worked. It was, as always, just like tonight, <laughs> Zoom is convenient, but adds a, a, a layer of stress in the technology, but for the most part, um, very nice to have. And, um, you know, the, the Slido option of being able to poll people so quickly is great. Um, I think, especially the word clouds, I think when you're in a group and you want to like brainstorm something, that's kind of a, a real neat thing to, to do. So probably something that uh, we'd want to expand on, maybe bring it to a future meeting here. Um, maybe the next one, you know, as far as topics and interactive, um, you know, thoughts on what the, what these meetings could have and topics and things like that. Um, so we'll switch uh, to water supply update. I've got a couple slides here, and then I turn it over to Al to, to dive into a bit more detail. Um, we have been getting a lot of questions about our supply and demand. Um, you probably in the news. Um, everybody around us is in restrictions. We have voluntary restrictions. Um, we are um, actually seeing some compliance with that. So. It's nice, uh, a common message, I've, I've spoken about this. Unfortunately, I have to speak about the drought more often than I want to because this is the third one we've had in the last six years. Um, but it's, it's, you know, and Al will show you more detail, but it's, it's not as bad as 2016, which kind of set the mark um, for the water system, but it still continues to be um, dry. We've, um, you know, we're behind on precipitation. We've got some warmer days, um, we do need the rain, but hopefully nothing like some places that suddenly get it and they get it in pockets. So um, in addition to that, well, we've got two big things that have really helped us out, continue to. We've been managing our system such that um, our wells are in, in really good shape at the moment. So we have those, but um, we have Madbury well number five, which provides us a bit more buffer. It's been running here for a couple of weeks now. Al says, and actually giving some of the other Madbury wells a break that way. Um, but the bigger news is the Haven well that's been online for a year now. And um, Al did show, um, put this graph together. And what you can see here is for the entire uh, period of time, the summers, so 2014 was when the Haven well was shut down. So we had to supplement water to peas for those um, seven years. Um, Oh, well, going on eight because last year would have been the eighth year, but mid uh, summer we were able to, to get the Haven well on. But as you can see, um, a good chunk of water supplying peas uh, initially, those early years, um, higher than others because we were in the process of getting uh, the temporary the demonstration treatment on for Harrison and Smith. And then when that went on, we were able to pump those a little bit more. Um, but that's uh, the percentage of water into peas that came from the Portsmouth system. And that, as you can see so far this year, we've only, it, it's more of a use it just to, you know, keep it active when you have an interconnection, you don't want to let it just sit idle uh, for a long period of time. So Al, go ahead and um, yeah, yeah, take over your one from um, I just get to it in a second. Uh, so this graph right here, tank levels, you put this together, looking at how we watch the water levels every day. I don't know how this is. This it's is, it's uh, a full week. week. It's a week. <laughs> so every uh, day the tanks drop and we watch this all real time data and we fill the tanks every uh, every night. The tanks drop during the day a little bit at night. So this is part of keeping the water fresh in the tanks as part of small operations. Um, well, we can keep an eye on this just to make sure we're not dropping too fast. So you look at the slope. So warmer days than our highest demands are usually midweek. So we see what the tank levels drop pretty quickly. Um, and we're able to turn things on when we cover. Um, so we reach our, our normal levels uh, by morning. 
I'm sure all the tanks are, are top level. Um, Brian said, we are still in the severe drought uh, warning here. Um, the southeastern, most of southern New Hampshire um, is considered severe drought by the state drought monitor, the USGS um, drought monitor. Uh, so we're still responding to this. Um, our water levels, too, just like you were talking about how we have the um, Haven Well has saved us about 70 million gallons over the past year. So yeah, that's how much we pull out of the Haven Well. So that's basically saved our wells in the Portsmouth side. So our water levels, looking closer, are actually higher than they have been summer for these past five years. So our, water, our well water is pretty shape right now. Precipitation, you can see here uh, the red columns in that chart are 2022. The blue are the 24-year average based on the data set that we work with. Um, as you see, it's been very dry since uh, last fall, really, November last year, getting normal, normal below average levels each month. Um, in July, we had slightly above, but we we're below again in August. August, the latest, I believe, was 2.15 inches, and the normal for August is around 2.9. So even with the rain that's expected, Tonight, tomorrow, it's going to still going to be below normal. Um, as, and as you see, the normal 12 month rolling average, we can look over the water year over the rolling 12 months period where we're at. And right now, we're down 3.16 inches, which is 7% below the normal. This is looking at uh, our river flows. So we look at river flows. This is an indication of how, how much the reservoir is recharging. Um, we use the Oyster River gauge, it's sort of a corollary to our Bellamy, since the Bellamy is not a gauged watershed, the Oyster River is in a very close proximity, um, so we can see the variations. Um, the red line, squiggly line here, is the 2022 data. Um, the red blob that goes through the middle is sort of your mean, your normal river flows. And as you see towards July, uh, we dropped into the below normal, even lower than 10 percentile in the river flow. It jumped up with some storms in uh, early August, I believe that is, early July. Um, that has come back down into that sort of lower than the 10 percentile. And here's the reservoir and how it's responded. So the chart on the left here, you see the 2016 drought is the water level in the reservoir. Um, it dropped a little over four feet below the spillway that year. 2020, it was approaching that before we got some heavy rains in October. Um, and then in 2021, you see the water level dropping fairly quickly, and we were preparing it for it to be drought conditions last year, but then the rains of July started and were stopped, and that gave us a lot of, a lot of water last year. Our reservoirs has stayed above flowing over the spillway since then until around July 1st this year, when again, it's dropped off because of the lack of precipitation. Um, that is a steady decline, as you see here in the water level of the reservoir. Um, the chart on the right compares these lines. It's kind of hard to see the colors here. The, the lower one is 2016. Obviously, that is when it dropped the lowest. Um, where the dark black line right there is 2022 right now. And you see we're tracking pretty closely to the 2020 um, drought at this point in time. One thing to notice here, it's not until really October, early mid-October, that they start coming back up again. This, this was the case both in 2020 as well as 2016. That's when the leaves have fallen off the trees, the vegetation is not uptaking the water quite so much, um, and any rain that we do get does help to uh, run off and get into um, the reservoir. So we've seen some rains have helped us recently, just getting the ground saturated. So I. I'm hopeful that in the future rains here that we see in September, we'll start seeing some more runoff and our level of the reservoir will stabilize and start to come up. Okay. Yeah. So just let me know when you want me to. Okay. Yeah, and I think for this stuff, we'll hold questions until the end um, for all the presentations other than we have Dr. Tell's piece. Um, but yeah, I wanted to update the swag on two different tap sampling projects that have occurred. This first one we've talked about a few times. It's with the NRDC, um, where they requested tap samples from over 19 communities across the nation. And we had I had sent in a sample in the summer of 2021 from a resident residential home in Portsmouth. 
and it was analyzed with Eurofins, which is a commercial lab, and they had a new method that they were just starting to roll out to test for 70 PFAS. Um, and so what they found in that sample uh, was seven different PFAS at a total of 50.1 parts per trillion. Um, that was, overall, that wasn't surprising, except for one compound called PFPRA at 35 parts per trillion. Um, and it was just one tap sample in time. So we were really curious about, you know, like where is this coming from? Or, you know, we've never seen this before, um, how much might be in it. And then incidentally, if you want to go to the next slide, Brian, um, Mayor Matthew Hampshire also participated in this project and they had also sent in a tap sample and they also received a similar result of 42 parts per trillion in their uh, tap sample for PFPRA. And so the Merrimack uh, community advocate myself wrote a letter to the New Hampshire DES and US EPA asking for them to test some additional samples uh, to try to confirm this result and see if we could also find it in source water. Um, it was, I know, in speaking with Brian, it was also a challenge. There's, I don't know of any other labs other than Eurofins that can test for this PFAS. Um, so this is kind of a new technology and a new offering, and it's um, just something that's not readily available, and there's not a lot of information. And so um, we updated you at the last meeting that the samples had been, the repeat samples had been collected in March. We received the Eurofins data. So the Portsmouth data is highlighted in yellow. So um, the initial sample from last summer showed 35 parts per trillion of PFPRA. And then the repeat sample of Eurofins uh, from March showed 2.1, which was obviously a big difference. Um, and then we recently just got back, the EPA was also testing the same water uh, from the sample taken in March, and they came back as non-detect. So, um, I don't really know, like, I think it's left us with more questions than answers. Why are we getting three different levels uh, for PFPRA? Um, and then similarly in green, that's the Merrimack results. So you'll see initially again last summer, they got 42 parts per trillion for PFPRA uh, when it was rerun through Eurofins, a different sample um, later on in March, it was 3.3. And then EPA also found it as non-detect. Um, there's no additional testing opportunities to repeat these testing that I'm aware of. Um, I just think it's important to report back the information and that we did get three different levels uh, between two different labs. Um, Merrimack saw similar results. And I know Brian just forwarded me tonight something. I don't know if you can share, I kind of skimmed it, but I know New Hampshire DES wrote up a report about this. That no, the, 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 yeah, the, um, today, Brandon Kernan, uh, of DES boarded uh, the EPA's report on okay. this. So it's something we'll, we'll be able to share. We, sure. could, we could put it up um, on our website, but they they essentially, they talk about their methodology and the fact that um, the challenge of the short chain compounds, and I don't want to get into Jonathan's <laughs> um, uh, expertise area, but though we don't, have a lab person here, but they basically talk about all the qualifiers and the difficulty, um, especially with short chain compounds. There are no standards. Um, methods are all uh, essentially um, variants of existing methods. So they, the labs have to come up with their own that, that um, have that. That was part of what Al, um, and Al, you might jump in too. Um, Al's even better versed at this than I am, but um, basically, a lot of the labs we reached out to said they don't test for it yet because there's not there are not those standards and there's a lot of interference. So you know I don't want to speak for your friends, but you know they could have gotten an indication of something that gave them a number that was basically some interference of of other compounds. I mean we're dealing in the trillions, so um, to have us. To, a stray bit of something come in that throws your, your data off is, is possible, but that's part of what the other labs had said too, right? Yeah. yeah. Did we ever get any um, anything from your offense? The other examples of exploration of security I'm I'm And what I do, so this is part of an unpublished report. Um, when I reached out to NRDC for an update, they so I do know that they did find PFPRA. I think in almost all the 19 samples from the first round. 
um, they were still collecting, NRDC was collecting more data. Uh, I don't know if that was repeat data or new communities, and they were working on a report. The lead scientist who had been working on this project had taken a, a family leave for six months, so that kind of put a pause in some of their data analysis, but um, we can keep you updated as more information comes out. I think that's a fair point. Like, Eurofin should probably respond as to why they got two different levels. Um, I do know one thing that was interesting too, Eurofins is a national lab, so they have multiple locations. And the first sample was sent to California, and the second sample was sent to Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I have no idea if that had anything to do with it. It wasn't the same, even though Eurofin is like a chain, um, it wasn't the same actual lab. So, but you would expect, you wouldn't expect this, I guess, in my opinion. Um, so uh, as you know, I don't know how much more information we're going to have to report on this, but this was a project um, for communities across the nation. And as more information unfolds, we can keep you posted. But there's no opportunities for additional testing at this time. So next slide. If I, I'm sorry, I don't know if you guys can see. I had my hand raised. I was just going to ask if um, you knew which type of instrument it was run on. There's sort of different types of mass spec. Um, and Brian and Al are right, there can be some interferences or, you know, when you're basing it on the mass of the chemical, there can be other chemicals that might have the same mass. Um, and I think with some of the smaller compounds, they don't like break into smaller fragments like the bigger ones do. So PRA is the three carbon chain one and PFBA, I think it can also have this problem where it can be a little you have a little less confidence in the exact identity of the compound because you don't get that like fragmentation pattern. Whereas the bigger compounds, as it runs through, you're looking not just at the mass of the chemical, but sort of like what it breaks into. Um, but there are other types of mass spec, like high resolution mass spec instruments, where you kind of get more decimal points on the mass and it gives you more confidence. So I didn't know if you had any information about the type of instrument and if there were different types of instruments between the two your fins labs. So, um, Laura, we can, we can share this uh, report with you because it does have um, more detail, but, you know, something at the moment I'm not able to put my hands on. Um, the isotope, I believe they're using isotope dilution. Uh, let's see, injected into, so, so. EPA used a high resolution machine. Yeah, Agilent, yeah. Agilent 1290 UPLC coupled to an Agilent 6546 six, quadruple time of flight mass spectrometer. Mm -hmm. Sounds pretty impressive, but um, I, uh, so I, I, I think we can share this with you and then um, that might provide a bit more insight. Yeah. And if it doesn't, Laurel, I think we could also reach out to, I'm happy to reach out to your events too. Yeah. And, um, um, if there was different machines at either site, um, and if that may have played into it. Yeah, there, there was an email chain, which I personally, when the first results came back, I, I said, can someone clarify why such a discrepancy? And I didn't get that answer either. So, um, you know, it's, it's a little frustrating. Um, for sure, because I mean, initially we're, here we are for I don't know how many months, four months, thinking we had 35 parts of something, and then when the Earthings, their second round came in, it was you know almost non-detect two parts, and then the EPA says non-detect, and they they were non-detect across the board. They sampled 20 different um, sites, and all of them were non-detect. I'm curious, and for the EPA testing, I see the LOQ is one to 10. Do you happen to know, is that like a range for different compounds? Because it's not necessarily inconsistent. Like if the LOQ is 10, then that's not necessarily inconsistent with finding 2.1. So I didn't know if you had any more information about that or not, or if they had a sense of whether it was plausible with their analysis, there could be a couple parts per trillion and it was just like below what they could reliably measure. Um, results from the EPA lab indicated that concentrations in all samples were less than 10 nanograms um, limit of 
quantitation set by EPA and were likely less than one uh, nanogram per liter. So okay. this it. is in their report, so I can share that with you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the second project that we were part of um, was with The Guardian, which is a, a media outlet that covers scientific topics, and they had reached out to different communities across the country looking to collect tap, tap samples, and they wanted to do uh, two different tests. They wanted to do a standard US EPA method, um, and, then, and then also a total organic fluorine or TOF method, um, and compare the results. Uh, I guess to just be clear, in my non-scientific brain. So, you know, the EPA method looks for very targeted compounds that we know what they are and how many, and we can identify how much is in the sample. Total organic fluorine just looks at the total amount of fluorine in the sample, which fluorine is the building block of PFAS. So it doesn't tell you how many PFAS are in there. It just tells you how much fluorine is in there. Um, so it's more used for like a screening method to trying to get a sense of how much PFAS might be in something. And so the purpose of this was to try to get a sense of are we missing a significant amount of PFAS when we just use a standard EPA method? Um, that's what the, the lead on this project was trying to get at. And so uh, Portsmouth was one of the communities that was of nine communities that was contacted. We collected tap samples of the DPW, um, alcohol leading that, and sent them in. Um, they sent their standard EPA method out to Europeans, and then the uh, top method went out to the University of Notre Dame and a scientist there by the name of Graham Peasley. Next slide, please. And so um, the chart on the right is all the um, results from all nine communities. So um, for Portsmouth, they found using the standard EPA method, they found uh, 10 parts per trillion of PFAS. And uh, using the total organic fluorine method, they found 164 parts per trillion. Um, and as you can see in the other communities too, they saw you know, somewhat similar results in the sense that the EPA method had much less amount of PFAS versus the TOF, the total organic fluorine showed higher amounts of total organic fluorine. Again, that doesn't tell us like how many PFAS and what level of each of those PFAS are like the EPA method. So it's important to understand there are two different tests, but um, this TOF method is a, a newer method. It's been peer reviewed. Um, and it's again, at the in speaking with Dr. Graham Peasley, his goal is to have this be more of like a screening tool for communities and water folks to be able to run quick tests that these are quite affordable as well to try to get a sense of how much total fluorine might be in there so you can get a sense of what other PFAS might be in the water that you can't detect from a standard test. Um, and so next slide. Uh, and Dr. Graham Peasley, I believe I included this when I updated everyone on the Guardian article, but he shared these two um, papers with us. So one is uh, the peer-reviewed paper on his particular method. He actually uses a soda bottle cap. You kind of see in the picture and he has a filter in the cap. You fill up the bottle, tip it over, you let the water drain out. And then there's media within the cap that captures the fluorine and then he runs it through his machine. Um, and then the paper on the right is, you know, and asking Dr. Graham Peasley, well, what if there's 164 parts per trillion of fluorine in the ports of water, what could that be? And he kind of Point, he pointed us to this, this article, which talks about a study that was done in Germany, where they looked at um, tap samples and they found a lot of ultra short chain PFAS uh, that you wouldn't normally pick up on an EPA method. And so, um, you know, his, his thought was that potentially we have ultra short chain PFAS in the tap water, um, but we, we don't know that for sure, but that was what he pointed us to to try to give us some more answers. So next slide, please. And you should have those papers if you want to read them in more depth. So um, we wanted to just open this up for a discussion on some future testing opportunities. So the, as I mentioned, the NRDC project is not published yet. Uh, they are still, I believe they've wrapped up sample collection and they are planning to publish a report at a later date. They have not offered us any additional testing opportunities and I don't believe there's any additional opportunities through the DES or the EPA. Um, but the Guardian project has been completed. Um, there was an article written about it. Their results were published on all nine communities. And Dr. Graham Peasley from Notre Dame has offered to conduct additional total organic fluorine analysis on additional tap samples from the city of Portsmouth. He also would be willing to do it um, at the Peace Trade Court as well. 
Uh, he said the soda bottle method is a very inexpensive method for him. So it's not costly and it also is easier in the sense when you take an EPA test, you have to, um, there's, you have to pack it in ice, you have to ship it overnight in a cooler. It's very complicated and expensive where these um, soda cap methods, you just basically put them in the bag and it gives you a mail in regular envelope, regular mail. So um, it's not as cumbersome as an EPA test. And so we just wanted to open it up for discussion about, you know, should we consider additional TOF testing? Um, again, we don't, as we saw with the NRDC project, it hasn't given us a lot of answers, um, but we just wanted to see what other people are thinking. And if we want to take Dr. Graham Peasley up on his offer to do more testing, um, if there's any pros and cons to that. And then also if anyone has any questions about short chain PFAS, I know we have Dr. Patel here, we have Dr. Shader who may be able to give us some comments too. Open it up. Is it, would it, um, is Dr. Grant Kesey asking, is he doing this on his own? Yeah, for this? Be free. Okay. yeah he wouldn't charge us. Yeah. Uh, my only worry would be that, like you said, the fluorine um, in Saudi water bells, it's not, you know what I mean, showing us what PFAS are in there. Right. It's just showing us this fluorine. It isn't actually conclusive and leading us to a conclusion. Right. You know, at least we'll see. Yeah, that's a fair point. I know in, in prepping for this meeting, I asked Brian if anyone has called, because the Guardian article did publish, and it was a national article, um, where the NRGC report hasn't been published yet, and it's the data side, I hope people allow me to share our data with this, you know, on this forum, but um, there will be a report at some point, but has he received any calls or concerns from people after reading the Guardian report and article? Yeah, right, okay. Yeah, I think, you know, it's important to put it in context Like this is evolving science. It's not giving us, you know, concrete information, um, but I think it's a fair point for sure. Any other thoughts on? Well, I, mean, I certainly don't see any harm in moving forward with this project, studying it to the point it is evolving science. Perhaps we can't determine it from the data now, that doesn't mean in the future we won't be able to make some sort of an interpretation or change our practices or, or something to take action to try and remediate what's going on, right? The difficulty that Al and I have is, you know, fielding questions, or including presenting data like this here in this forum, and us as, you know, regulated water supply is the, the unknown. So, I mean, like all the way back to the beginning of, of PFAS with us, um, you know, people didn't know what PFAS was way back when the Haven well was contaminated. And now, of course, it's nationwide and, and in many more places. Um, I, you know, the methods, and there's been, you know, some feedback, including, you know, the, the PFPRA um, comments, uh, you know, I know the EPA gets criticized, and there have been a lot of, um, I will say, well, the best way to say it is finger pointing that the methods aren't out there and the samples aren't out there, and, and there's things in the water we don't know about, and why can't EPA get get uh, better and quicker and, and that? And, and I think the complexity of it really comes to light with the PFPRA. So total flooring, we're out on the, the edge of that as well, and maybe two years or five years from now, there will be a method that is vetted and accepted and replicated, um, you know, because that's what, that's what's tough for Al and I. You get a number, what does it mean? And, you know, in reference, I mean, there were the 10 sites, which were all known contaminated sites, but, you know, what's it like a reference point, like our number versus, you know, Louisville, Kentucky, um, you know, Cincinnati, Iowa, you know, California, that, you know, that, that's what, you know, to be the first all the time is, is tough because you don't have a reference. You don't know how this compares. And then of course, you know, the, the, the health data is lack even more lacking than any analytic, analytical data. I would just say that, you know, the lack of clarity on the data, if that's 
put out publicly. Um, it's it's basically misinformation, uh, or, you know, because um, it doesn't. We don't know what it means. Mm -hmm. I think context is important, absolutely. Yeah. And that's why I think, too, okay, well, you haven't received any OMB calls from people yeah. saying, oh my God, what does this mean? Yeah. You know? And I think for folks that I've talked to as well, even if we can't put this data into a ton of context, someday we may be able to, which is important. And I do think there are things we could tell people even now, like if someone is concerned about any of the PFAS in the water, we know that there's filtration methods, there's things that you can do at your house. We talked about that at the water forum. So, even if you know we don't have a lot of information to give people, I still think there's resources and things we can tell people to do. That may, yeah. And the context is important. And I, I also just want to add that you know you're right. We are on the edge, Brian. We've always been a leader here, I think, and we've always done things that other communities haven't done. And it's important we keep doing it and we keep contributing to the science and we keep progressing. I'm just kidding. Um, I think it is important to be a leader. Um, but I will we'd be careful of not becoming a research facility where it's costing our taxpayers to be a research facility, because uh, I know that's not fair to, you know, my grandmother or your grandmother, single mother, you know what I mean? There's, um, that's not a fair uh, burden to put on just a single, you know, taxpayer. Yeah, and, and just to be clear, both of these projects cost nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and other tap sample projects that I know my group Testing for Peace has been part of, we either raise the funds or we receive grants. Um, I know in the project that we've done, we, we have either provided the resources or these projects in particular were done at no cost. Um, and I'll just one more comment. Um, I, I'm glad like the Guardian's doing you know this, but they are kind of, uh, it's a news outlet, right? It's not, it's kind of a biased, um, you know, they're not a science journal or a nature journal. Um, if they were coming out with these studies, I would be, all about it, I'd be reading it up and down. Um, you know, I mean, if one news media is coming out with something, I'm gonna read it, but I will read it with a grain of salt and just be aware that there might be some biases or, you know what I mean, that they're clearly trying to have a goal of a message. Um, and that's just you know, evident. I, just, I can't ignore that. <laughs> well, I, I, I will add, I know it doesn't cost, the sampling has cost us nothing but time and effort and, <laughs> It, it's, it's a considerable amount of, of Al's time, you know, some of my time, the coordination, and then, you know, getting a result. I mean, there ha we, we have to decide what we're gonna do with this information and without guidance. I mean, it, it's even more so with the new health advisories that lead us to almost say, you know, at the moment, you know, you can filter, you can, go to bottled water, but there's no way to know if it's, if there's a quadrillion of anything in there. So that that's, I mean, that's a point I'm making. I mean, and, and we're ahead of the curve in a lot of stuff. We've got treatment that, you know, first in New Hampshire with resin filtration, we piloted, we've got, you know, eight and a half years worth of a, you know, very good data set of known compounds and, and that. So, I mean, we're, we're good there. I, 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 I would personally, you know, just, you know, on behalf of the water system, say that, you know, when standards come out and when accepted methods are there, that's that's when, you know, we're ready to go. I mean, I'm, I'm on a national um, American Waterworks group, and there, there are people on calls that I'm on that have not sampled yet. <laughs> And I, I say, what do you recommend, Brian? And I say, I'm gonna tell everybody, you gotta at least go sample. Well, we're not required to do it yet. You know, so they, you know, of all the compounds of the lower limits and, and that. So it's, it's, it's quite enlightening when you kind of get out of our realm and, and see you know, what's happening across the country. Is it true that bottled water is not tested? I cover that in my section. <laughs> Stand by. Yeah. Stand by. <laughs> I do have one, I have one technical question for you, Mark. Now you're Dr. Shader, too. For this total organic fluorine analysis, uh, we have fluoride to reward in the amount of what would be equivalent to 700,000 parts per billion. When you run a total fluorine analysis, somehow they have to separate the organic from the inorganic components. 
But if there's so much chloride in the water, does that affect the total fluorine calculation? I'm going to hand that to the world because I imagine she's <laughs> just leaning into her duck. <laughs> sure, yeah, I'm happy to, to chime in with what, what I know about this. And I think that's a question that I've had also. Um, so there is a, well, the, um, you write the Guardian article is, you know, that was done for a news outlet. There is a peer reviewed method that Dr. Peasley's lab developed kind of as a screening method for looking for organofluorine. They do have this filter media that is very specific for organofluorine. So the idea is that the fluoride would not stick. And they did a number of tests to kind of validate that. Um, but you're right, with so much inorganic fluorine there, if it just like a small percent of that remained, that could kind of throw things off. And I know, you know, every water system is different water chemistry. So, you know, I would love to see more, more testing. I mean, I was had my hand raised also because I did want to applaud the water supply for being at the cutting edge and for, you know, taking part in, in testing that's, you know, not required and kind of telling us new things. Um, I've worked with a number of water suppliers on the Cape and some on Cape Cod, and, you know, some have taken us up on offers to test for pharmaceuticals and other emerging contaminants um, back 10 years ago, and some didn't want to, you know, they didn't want to have to, you know, spend the time or the effort to explain it or deal with people's questions. So you're to be applauded for for being at the cutting edge and you know teaching other water supplies how to um, approach this and how to communicate about it, so I think I think it's a learning opportunity. And you know, in terms of doing future testing with Graham, if there's opportunities to um, look for trends over time, or you know, do some more quality control tests to just see, I don't know if there's ways to test the water like before the fluoride is added and after. I mean. I spent years working in a chemistry lab, so I could think of different variations of it that could kind of address this, you know, to see if if there is any interference from the fluorine. So, um, so I'm always, you know, I understand the the constraints and the concerns about, you know, time and resources to answer questions and interpret the results. But I think it's great to be at the cutting edge, and it gives really an opportunity um, for the community to learn. Um, and I know right now, total organofluorine is not commonly tested in the U.S. and there aren't any regulations here, but Europe is working to develop a total organofluorine method and standards. Um, so I think that will spark some more kind of innovation on the, the technical side. So having this sort of like heads up to have a ballpark and yeah, we don't know yet exactly what the, the exact number is, but I think having a sense of the levels and how it compares to other water supplies is, is helpful to have that um, in advance to kind of prepare and look for trends over time and maybe work out some of the analytical chemistry questions that haven't been fully resolved. Thank you, that. And I think, I think just the last thing I know, a question that came up from um, Senator Perkins Kolka, I'm not sure if she's on Zoom, but um, in response to the Guardian article, she had just asked, about bioaccumulation and toxicity of short chain PFAS versus long chain. And so I was hoping Dr. Vitali or Dr. Shader could just kind of briefly, you know, work great. Dr. Peasy said that the 164 parts per trillion might be short chain or ultra short chain PFAS. Like what, what would be helpful for us to know as a community if, if that is the case? Yeah, so with PFAS for the alkyls, so those are the long squiggly ones whenever we draw them out. We have our long chains and we have our short chains. Um, the long chains are the ones that right now we have regulations for, at least four of them. And these are typically the ones when you look in human and animal studies, a bioaccumulate. So small amounts get in your body, they hang out for a while, the human body's really good at not letting go of these things. But for some reason, the short chains, based on the way that we measure these in people right now, it doesn't seem that's the case. We don't hold on to the short chains as much as we do the long chains. So even though there's parts per trillion, you're probably not building as much up in your body. But again, that's still an area of evolving science because the way that we measure that bioaccumulation is by taking a blood sample, specifically a serum sample. Get really picky about those words. So we don't really see short chains showing up in people's serum. So by looking at that, also looking at urine samples, we sort of infer that these are moving in and out of the body. 
when we take animals and we dose them and we dissect them and do all kinds of awful things we can't do to people, we definitely see that same pattern where the short chains go in and then they go out really. So since we can't dissect humans, we look at a lot of urine, that's a lot more friendly. So we see similar patterns in most of the time. And that's one of the reasons where when I talk later, you'll see that EPA put out a recommendation for a health advisory for a short chain compound and that's a thousand parts per trillion. That's much higher than the other health advisories. It's sort of based on this. But this is one of the things too that we have to keep track of with the sciences because there may be some case where some of these short chains are just accumulating in a different part of the body that we're measuring. But right now there doesn't seem to be a huge amount of evidence that's leading us towards that. So that's where this idea of short chains aren't as bioaccumulative is the reason that a lot of industries said, look, we switched to short chains. But the problem being that they'll just use larger amounts of those short chains to the same product and the same effect. Um, so you know, if, if you go back to that slide, we have the difference. If this is one of the things that in the realm of risk assessment, we're trying to understand. Come on, technology, work with us. <laughs> so, Ray, if you're looking at that gap, so like just reports that there's you're measuring 10 total in the assay and then 164, that gap of 154, that's right off the top of my head. You know, the question there is is that short chains? Or is that fluorinated pharmaceuticals? Or is that some other fluorinated commercial product that's not technically PFAS, which, you know, if we only get to the technical definition of PFAS, we get a whole swag on that. Um, so there's that question of what's in there is the short chains. And that is one thing where short chains are hard to measure. And that's why the, the methods for analysis are lagging on short chains. But that's also one of the same reasons that a lot of toxicity tests and toxicity data is missing because if we can't measure it in the study, how do we relate it to health effect? So that's where we have these gaps right now that we're trying to follow and keep an eye on. But again, that's why a lot more research has been focused on these longer chains because they are so much more cumulative than people. That's where we're really directing a lot of sort of the risk assessment effort at this time, but we know that the short chains are out there. Mm -hmm. So Laura, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add to that. Uh, no, I mean, I think you covered a lot of points there. Um, I guess one, yeah, that's a great point that, you know, the short chains don't accumulate in blood to the same degree. Um, there was a study that looked at radio labeled um, four, six, and eight um, carbon chain versions of the carboxylate. So PFOA, PFHXA, and PFBA. Um, which don't require you to be able to measure the chemicals specifically. You can just look at the where the radio labeled fluorine ends up. And they did see different patterns where the shorter chains accumulated in different organs than the longer chain ones. So, um, so we definitely have an incomplete picture right now. And there's definitely some concern that the shorter chains are, you know, having an effect in a different part of the body. And we're not necessarily measuring it accumulating in the same way, but it can still be harmful. Um, and I do try to point out that there are chemicals that are of concern, but don't ac accumulate in the body like bisphenol A, which you see on, you know, labels, BPA-free plastics, like that is cleared from our body and like on the order of hours or days. And so, but it's still a concern because we are sort of continually exposed from a lot of different sources. So it's not just the human half-life, it's also, um, you know, the amount that we're exposed to and, and how often. So but yeah, you made a lot of other good points too, Jonathan. Thanks. Okay, maybe that's a good segue. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Jonathan. Okay, so um, it's my turn. So I'm just going to give an update. Um, I'm going to go, I'm not going to try to whirlwind my way through these slides, but I'm not going to just read my slides the entire time. So if people have questions, I'll do a QA at the end of my section, right? Yep. So I'll do thanks. Sorry to interrupt, Jonathan, but yeah. um, you're the in a different mode now with PowerPoint. So it's like in notes mode, not the Ooh, that's fun. <laughs> <laughs> before you had it. So it was just the like uh, presenting the slide itself. So too, too can... many options here. Let <laughs> me know. Let's see. Uh, 
How's that looking? Yeah, better. Thanks. All right. Thank okay. you. So this was covered five parts. I'm going to do a primer on regulatory jargon. I know everyone in the room is probably familiar with these, but just in case anyone goes through, pulls up these slides online later, they reference. Um, we'll talk about the EPA announcement, how that compares to New Hampshire and other state guidance. Uh, key things from EPA risk messaging that are a little wonky when it comes to New Hampshire, and then some implications for New Hampshire. Uh, so next slide. So, EPA recently put out what are called interim health advisories. And in regulatory world, we get wrapped around the wheel with valid words. So a health advisory is a guidance value about health risk. EPA is very explicit in saying, this is not a regulatory value. You shouldn't be using it as that. But in New Hampshire, we often actually adopt health advisories as regulatory guidance. Some other states do that. Um, this is something that right now they put out a number and we'll talk about that and it's more meant as a guidance tool. So helping thinking about where are you at? So like we are talking about with organic flooring, where are you at on the spectrum? Where are you at relative to that goal? And sometimes these are calculated in a way that they're called a lifetime health advisory. They're supposed to cover you for 70 years out of an average 70 year lifespan. So they call it lifetime and just have an L in front of the AHA. That's that. These are different than maximum containment levels or MCLs, which are enforceable. So this is where we go out to public water systems and we say, thou shalt meet the summer. So in New Hampshire, we've adopted those for PFAS. Um, usually these are developed by the EPA, although for man-made contaminant, it's been a couple of years, almost a decade since they've made one for man-made contaminant. But an MCL, works like a health advisory in that they try to identify what is the health goal that we'd like to be at, but an MCL requires consideration of cost and benefit. So cost and benefit can have some different meanings if you want to bring in some folks from UNH or some best there, or we bring in Kernan to talk about how cost and benefits looked at the MCLs, they'd be happy to do that. I'm not an economist, I'm not gonna dig into that today. So if you could hit advance, and in New Hampshire, we have these really fun things called ambient groundwater quality standards or AGQS. So for public water systems, those apply in certain ways, uh, but really this is something that the department, State Department of Environmental Services uses to investigate groundwater contamination. Different states have different names for this, sometimes it's called their groundwater limit, so on and so forth. In New Hampshire, our AGQS almost always matches our MCLs. So if it's your public water threshold that we'd be concerned about, that's what we would start investigating if it was a groundwater contamination. That's how it works for the majority of our groundwater standards. And we try to match those numbers usually because when we're looking at like a waste site or a contamination area, we realize about 47% of cancer residents are in private wells. So we want our public water numbers the numbers that we're telling people on wells to kind of be similar. It'd be really weird if we said on public water, this level is okay, but on your private well, some other level is okay. So again, typically these match, um, but it's a New Hampshire specific value. Other states sometimes have it where the groundwater number is different than the MCL. That's based on their own rules. So that's my regulatory jargon slide. So EPA recently made an announcement this summer, and that is that they put out two interim health advisories for PFOA and PFOS. That is at 0.004 nanograms per liter for PFOA and 0.020 nanograms per liter for PFOS. That is much lower than 70 nanograms per liter. So this is currently something that's undergoing, it's still finishing up its scientific review board process. But EPA determined that based on their initial analysis, they thought it was important to put out an advisory, basically give people this number to understand this is the realm in which EPA is looking at developing a health advisory. The interim word there is because EPA has been very clear in telling us they are going to change this number this fall. This is a temporary number that they have put out. It will be something different by the fall. They've also been very clear, sort of regardless of what the SAB process does, it will still be below detection limits because these current health advisories are below what we can currently detect. So 
So it's something that if you have a detection or J flag in your data, that's where we think something's kind of there. You're probably above these health advisories. So in addition to these interim health advisories, they did issue final health advisories for two compounds, PFBS, short chain, and that's at 2000. And then Gen X, which is not really a great name. Apparently industry developed this. It's supposed to be like the cute alternative name, but they never watched the 90s horror movie. You never call something <laughs> Gen X. <laughs> so it's a long chemical name, but the it's part of this process called Gen X, and it's 10 nanograms per liter. So these are final health advisories for these two compounds. Now, again, yeah, health advisories are non-enforceable, but it's now a tool, and as EPA has put it out, they said public water system should start looking to see, do you detect anything? Because if you detect something, you are probably above our advisory, and you should start considering what that means. They are looking at some other PFAS compounds, so they may be issuing more health advisories over the next year or two. So we're trying to track that to see what they'll be doing. But in addition to issuing these interim health advisories for the summer and likely issuing new health advisories in the fall, and when I say fall, that's EPA fall, so that could be December. Um, they're going to initiate the process of proposing maximum contaminants for PFOA and PFOS. And that's where they would be considering cost and benefit, technical feasibility. Can they actually measure it at the level that they're proposing? Um, this would be a year-long rulemaking process. They would give public comment. It would be lengthy, so likely not be until 2023 until it's a very solid sense of where they're going. But a proposal will be coming out fall of 2022, which again might be December. So next slide. So in New Hampshire, we currently have four MCLs. So this is a recycled slide from past presentations that I've given to the SWAG and in other places. Um, for more information about how we develop those MCLs, there is a link. I'm also taking this as an opportunity to plug that DES is going to change its PFAS website this coming month. So for anyone that has gone to the PFAS blog and said, this is terrible, we got you. We're changing it. Um, it'll be a lot more fun. And there's a lot more information on there. It's way easier to navigate. So, we will have more information up there about that. But the key thing here is that New Hampshire already has MCLs in place, which means public water systems have now been testing for a while. They have several quarters of data under their belt. Unlike other states, as Brian mentioned, haven't even begun looking for these and haven't even done any testing for any one of these compounds. So in a lot of ways, the actions the EPA recommended around these health advisories of test and think about what that means, you've already tested and thinking about what that means. Um, with our MCLs, which are also our groundwater standards, we are following what the EPA is doing to see what information they put out, what the health advisor will be, and what their MCL proposal will be. Because we do have a legislative requirement every year to check and see what new information is out there and determine if there's sufficient information to make a recommendation to the legislature to adjust the MCLs. Now, that being said, since we know the interim advisories are interim and they're going to change, it probably wouldn't be very helpful to change the MCLs this month, go into the fall, change them again, EPA changes in the next six months. But that's up to the department, partnership with the legislature to figure out how they'll be reacting to what the EPA puts out. So it is something that we're following. So next slide. So this is a fun table that is probably out of date as of five minutes ago. <laughs> but it's just to give a sense of, if you look across some states that have been developing numbers, it's sort of spread. The new EPA health advisories for PFOA and PFOS are there in red. They are lower. But EPA is also looking at short-chain PFBA. They're also looking yeah, HXA, and we'll likely have what we call reference doses. These are the magic numbers we develop, basically drinking water guidance from. Those will likely be coming out in the next few months, and they'll probably be issuing health advisories along with those. Um, but again, there's already sort of a mixed landscape across the country of different numbers, different thresholds, and really sometimes what they mean, where 
Some cases it's guidance, other cases it's an MCL, other cases it's a groundwater number. So we are looking at how this will be changing. And also with the most recent announcement of EPA looking at adding PFO and PFOS to the circle list, this also may change how they're regulated. Next slide. So one of the things we frequently get asked is what is the major difference between EPA and New Hampshire and some other states' risk assessment? And so there's a couple decimal places off from where several states are from where EPA is. And it really comes down to the selection of study that they say it's a study from the Faroe Islands population. Um, it's a study looking at changes in antibody response um, following exposure to PFAS. And using this is how they derive their lower health advisory. This is something that they're responding to some comments from the science advisory report, but there are some other health effects they looked at that are in a similar range that you can sort of make clear that really they're not going to have a reference dose that is above really close to the other state values that are out there. So one of the things that's we're still waiting to understand though from EPA is okay, this is what they're doing for water. You want to hit the next slide. What does this mean for other media? Because this reference dose thing I keep saying over and over again is actually how states and the feds regulate things, not just in water, but in soil, and fish, sometimes in food and other media. And what's been difficult is right now EPA is telling us that their reference dose that they've developed is only for drinking water and that they would not use it for anything else. And that's so I think we're depending which office in EPA we have conversations with, we get a different answer on that. And that's one of the reasons several states are looking to understand how is EPA going to apply this. Because if you take that reference dose, which is expressed as an amount of chemical for an amount of body weight per day, and we start seeing the amount of that chemical, so in this case PFOA, PFOS, that either an adult or an infant in a certain age range can be exposed to, and we start being concerned. Issues when we start looking across other media, we realize basically other media could still swap that exposure even if we fix water. So, well, other media by meaning food and bail? Food. Food. Um, in the next few months, we will have a study come out that we, New Hampshire DES, did with the US Geological Survey, um, surveying soils across the state to understand the occurrence of PFAS across our state. And it it's everywhere. So that's, again, something where we're trying to understand how this works in because it's hard to have in one case where you're saying it's only this toxic in water, but somehow it's not this toxic in food, consumer products, soil. So again, depending which EPA program we've talked to, we've gotten different communication around this. That's why we're hoping that they also provide guidance around this for finalized health advisory. I realize this is sort of going off from evaluating drinking water, which is the focus of this group, but for risk assessment, it all comes back to sort of these core numbers. And that's one of the reasons where some states and even state agencies are sort of taking a slower reaction to these interim health advisories because we're being told in one sense they apply, but in another sense, it doesn't. If, if I may, on other compounds, it's my understanding that's why some states have, for, for different regulated contaminants, they have different numbers because that state itself, you might be exposed, like New Jersey, to yeah. some contaminant in your food and all that, so that they set the drinking water a little different than New Hampshire or Ohio or yeah, and that's the thing of accounting for background sources of exposure. Yeah. And that's something where oftentimes some states have that data and they have a plethora of it, and other states don't. You know, a good example that I have to come back to because it's personal to me is fish consumption. So, right now, our state, whenever we try to understand people's risk for eating fish in the state, we have to default to EPA's information, which is national averages. Sometimes it's regional, but it's not actually specific to New Hampshire residents. But over the last year, we've been working with Dartmouth College to actually develop New Hampshire specific numbers. We're hoping to get that out soon. And it does reflect that we have a specifically higher fish consumption rate 
and that we need to start looking at that. But oftentimes, states simply don't have that information. And it's really boring information, so it's really hard getting the procedures to want to study because asking people how much fish they eat is not exciting. Um, so next slide. I don't want to delay us. So around some of the risk communication points, EPA does have a document out. There's a link to it on there. Um, it answers a lot of what they've identified as being the commonly asked questions that they're expecting nationwide. You know, one of their first things is if you have detectable levels, what does that mean? New Hampshire public water systems are already testing. So a lot of that is weighing out what that means and thinking about if the health advisory is a goal we should be at, what would it take for us to get to that goal? How frequently do we have to see them? So those issues. One of the other points is that they recommend if people are concerned about levels that are found in the drinking water to contact their clinicians. Something that our health and human services here and our department have been very clear that a little frustrated with EPA putting out that guidance because most clinicians still have no idea what PFAS are. They're still dealing with COVID and trying to figure out this monkeypox thing. But we do know that National Academies of Science Engineering, they did put out some recommendations to the CDC agency that deals with chemical exposures and that they may be changing some of the guidance soon. Um, so we're waiting to see what they do with that because yeah, we're not staff to come up with guidance for clinicians. And to get a question from earlier, you know, EPA right now, if you have PFAS above the interim health advisory, they're not recommending bottled water because you can't really guarantee that bottled water doesn't have PFAS that parts for quadrillion. In New Hampshire, we are currently the only state, Laurel, you have to correct me if someone else has joined the bandwagon, but we're the only state right now that actually has a regulation on bottled water. Again, that I'm aware of, where bottled water suppliers have to at least meet our MCMOs. Um, that might actually get the rug pulled out from it because if EPA sets an MCL that's higher than ours, then because bottled water is considered a food product, then it'll be defaulted to whatever FDA says, which FDA would say what EPA says. So we'll, actually, we'll have to figure out what to do about that one. Um, health and human services as they regulate food. But right now, if it's a licensed bottle of water supplier in the state, they are required to meet at least our MCLs. So for a lot of those, we know that they're a licensed bottle of water company, they have probably been testing. When we rolled out our MCLs, we actually went out and did grab sampling off shelves to test. There's only one bottle of water supply company that exceeded our MCLs. It hit the news. They went out of existence pretty quickly afterwards. That wasn't great, but they were in Massachusetts. Um, so other than that, you know, the health advisors do apply to public water systems, but they've EPA is also not currently applying those to super hot sites. Um, it was a little interesting that the week before, about two weeks before, they announced these inter health advisories sort of swap in numbers for what they use at Superfund sites that are comparable to what the CDC had previously recommended. Those are orders of magnitude above the health advisories. So those are always sites that are more complicated. I realize that you all have peas here right across the way. As a Superfund site, that's also a Department of Defense site, it does make it more complicated for the state when trying to Delineate are you following our AGQS, our MCLs, EPA health advisories, these screening levels that they just got? It makes that complicated. So, next slide. So, for New Hampshire, we do have MCLs. Um, we actually have MCLGs, MCL goals, which are zero for all four compounds. So, we like everyone to be there. We realize zero is not totally achievable, but we like to get there. Um, EPA is going to be proposing something this fall. They're probably going to propose a enforceable MCL that is unlikely to be identical to the health advisory. That's going to be complicated for risk communication with the general public, with folks that are going to see one number is EPA will be very clear and not saying it's safe or not safe, but oftentimes something ends up in the garden. It'll be asked, is it safe, not safe? And that EPA is going to have a different proposed level based on cost technology and stability. As far as existing data goes for PFBS and Gen X, we've had a couple of detects of Gen X in some places in New Hampshire that oddly enough with a certain 
commercial lab, and we send it back for analysis. We don't detect it anymore. So it's a really fun conversation you all were having earlier. Um, but also with PFPS, any places that we possibly even have triple digits of PFPS showing up in groundwater, that site is already being addressed under our current MCLs. And that's one of the things with the shorter chain compounds that have these guidance values, drink water numbers, whatever you want to call them. A lot of these short chains are just they're showing up at higher numbers than what we're already triggering action, some of the thresholds for the long chain compounds. So that, yeah, that's something we have a great PFAS mapper. It's going to be updated to the website. We're so excited. Um, but it, we realize, like, you know, people are saying, well, what's this other compound doing here? It's, in some cases, we're already catching some sites based on different substances. We are also tracking what's going on with these other compounds, as well as hopefully something that maybe EPA can recommend around a class based regulatory tool. But again, one of the things we're trying to be careful of is you know, for DES, we're not the drinking water department. We are the Department of Environmental Services. So if it's a class based tool, is it a tool that works in drinking water? Is it a tool that works in soil? Is it a tool that works in these other media and types of investigation? EPA has alluded that they may be coming out with different recommendations for class tools for different media, which is going to be messy in some sense, but it's probably going to be a little bit more tailored based on what you're trying to address in certain situations. And then finally, you know, for House Bill 1264, every November we'll be reporting related to drinking water standards. This year we also just got a new piece of legislation related to air toxics. But for some reason they didn't make that the same big thing that January. So we get to write a report for November and then write around the report for January. Um, next slide. So while I have your attention, and because we do PFAS and more, um, I just want to say that you know, our program is here to help out with these questions, but also questions related to other drinking water issues. Um, we recently had an explosion of staff because we've been getting external grants to support those positions. So we have more people. They're all very excited to help. But we are also reviewing our ambient groundwater quality standards for 105 other chemical contaminants that are not PFAS. So these are contaminants that are found in surface water, they're found in groundwater, they're found around waste sites, they're found around gas stations, they're found around you, name it, the state probably has it. We're looking at updating these, and it is very likely that in a lot of cases, the drinking water programs are going to look at these as, yeah, as I mentioned before, if it's our groundwater standard that we're using to protect private wells, they will probably be looking at where would we be adopting this as a drinking water value or adjusting some of those. Um, we also have, it's an acronym within an acronym, sorry about that, but it's uh, called Apple Tree, and it's a federally funded program from the CDC that is focused on federal and state news sites where communities have concern about exposures and they want to learn more. So, for example, if you're wanting to learn more about Copley Landfill and you want to have a group try to put together the right team to explain what's going on at Copley, they're there to help out with that. If you want to talk about another landfill that is near another public water source and you want to understand what's going on in that investigation and how the right people pull together, they're there to help that. This team is there to do risk assessment, but they're also just to help out with risk communication and helping people understand what's going on at super fun sites or at our quirky little state sites that New Hampshire has. Um, we have a whole bunch of research collaborations, and I will just save that for at the end if you want to talk about fish, shellfish, and other weird stuff. But we also do support a lot of the private well testing initiatives. I realize this is more focused on public water systems, but if you're trying to tailor information for the communities out there, people are on private wells, we're happy to help out with that. There's a lot of state funded testing initiatives around the sea coasts, other places too right now that we're supporting. So if there's a way that we can help get the word out or just to reach out to certain communities, we're here for that. So the last slide is my contact information and I will open it up for questions. Um, I have a few, but if anybody else wants to start, okay, I'll start. <laughs> um, so with the current health advisories, which are obviously full load protection for mm -hmm. quadrille, how many water systems in New Hampshire right now would exceed that for PFOA kill? Would all of them? Not 
all of them, you have to get Brandon Kernan to get you that information. I did not come prepared with that. Okay. And then um, my question is more around New Hampshire. So we know the health advisories are interim, they're going to change, then this MCL process is going to start. So once EPA establishes an MCL, how does what is the process for New Hampshire to adopt those? Because I know when New Hampshire set their own MCL, which was there was no ETA MCL, like there was a there was a very big process with that. So does New Hampshire automatically adopt EPA's MCL? Will there be hearings and you know like what will happen? So because it's a federal MCL, there's a there's a rulemaking process that would go into that and to get the full pile on the website. Yeah, I would defer to Brandon for that one. But if the federal MCL is lower than our MCLs, we're adopting it as the federal ones. We can't be can't be higher than that. That's, okay. that's just how the MCLs work. So well, I know when New Hampshire set their MCLs, industry sued New Hampshire for that. And it it, you know, there was a Pause. I don't know if this is going to take. There was a pause in implementing it. There was a delay. Yes. Okay. So, and then eventually it became law. But so, could we expect if New Hampshire has to automatically adopt EPA's MCL, should they be lower? Should we expect lawsuits and people pushing back on that? That would be on the EPA. So, it would okay. be the EPA would be happy to. And that's one of the big questions of. You know, like when they make their proposal for their MCL in the fall, they will be opening up for public comment, but it's pretty fully expected EPA is going to be the challenge on this, or even when they get through their public comment process, they would be the ones that would most likely be challenged. And that's, that is EPA's right. okay. fight, and that's, so once they come out at the other end, once they come out the other end, and there's a number that's established, New Hampshire can easily adopt that. Yeah, because it's Without the federal government. Yeah. Okay. I think that, those are my questions for you now. Thank you, Bob. And by the way, that was excellent. Uh, yeah, so thank you, Dr. Uh, this is excellent. This is a lot of good information, a lot of information that I've heard before. It was nice to get uh, just the whole breakdown. Um, and uh, the information said on the short chain versus the long chain. Um, it's very interesting. I've heard more concerns long chain, obviously. Um, there was another process I have to stumble upon just in my uh, research on my the process of getting rid of PFAs, the mm -hmm. line process. Do you, have you heard any familiar with that? Or is that totally I've seen thing? a couple of headlines about that. Yeah. I'm not terribly familiar with that process. Uh, I know our state is trying to figure out Sort of a lot of destruction process with PFAS right now because we also have that firefighting from kickback program. We're stockpiling fire from to destroy it, so stockpile it. I'm not particularly familiar with that destruction process. Okay. I know a lot of groups are trying to study that. Um, Laurel, do you have any insight on that destruction process? Um, I know there was a paper that came out, I think it was last week. I was on vacation, so I haven't read it yet. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think I know it was um that one specifically had a mixture that was like one part water and like eight part solvent so it's not something that by itself you would do directly on water but I think the idea was you could like run if you had run water through a carbon filter or kind of pre-concentrated it that it could be a way to break down the PFAS but it's definitely an area of active research um yeah, I don't have a lot more about that at this point. Uh, a question on, so you mentioned the, the reference dose for EPA is based on the, uh, basically the response for tetanitis, tetanus sure. shot. I mean, and, and when, when I read the news articles, it always says cancer, and I know there, you know, cancer is, one of the the things that you know you can be affected by drinking PFAS contaminated water, but is that a different level? So it, it's it's like that's what's difficult. It's like it's not across the board that you know at this level it's affecting the immune response getting this vaccine. 
So are there other, like I could just see a chart. It's like, oh. Well, so in their report, they do have a, like a long table of different levels for different health outcomes. So and that's both for PFOA and PFOS. So there's sort of this spread of different concentrations that are suspected to cause certain health effects. With PFOS, EPA this time is not looking at that one as a perception. As a part of this process, the EPA is looking at changing the classification of PFOA's status as a carcinogen, which if they do simply by how the rules of MCLs are written, the goal for PFOA will be zero. There's no math behind it. It's once it's in this category of carcinogen, the goal shall be it's like zero. arsenic. It's right. The same. Because the arsenic's goal is zero. Yeah. And that's the thing where right now arsenic's goal is zero. If we wanted to get to one in a million risk for arsenic, we would be at point zero zero one two ish somewhere around there. Parts per billion for arsenic. The national MCL is 10. Because removing that much arsenic is costly. It's not really feasible. It's a huge burden. New Hampshire, we recently cut. 10 down to five, that's still not 0 0.00, whatever the number should be, or one in a million at least, and it's still not zero. So that again is gonna be one of the things in EPA's MCL process, they are going to have to grapple through that and give that justification of whichever level they're setting. You know, what is the cost? What is the benefit? There's sort of different ways that that can be done that is very likely to be where EPA will be challenged in court. And that may be one of the reasons where EPA may get a proposal out this fall, December, but it may actually end up being delayed by several more years just because it'll be a challenge. So. It's similar to land and ECF too, like set a level for land even though zero is really stable. We learned about that. Yeah. So for a lot of these chemicals, especially things that are carcinogens, we set the goal for zero because you don't want any carcinogen in your water. But it does ultimately come down to what's the cost, what's the feasibility. And it is that challenge too of how much are you getting from other sources? There's a step in the drinking water. When you're setting a drinking water number where you're asking how much are you getting from these other places? And it's that tough spot where you're saying, okay, you can remove this all from water somehow. Are you still getting swamped from everything else? Um, you know, that's likely sort of one of the reasons that we're hoping you know, is that EPA sort of is taking the step of classifying these as hazardous substances because it's recognizing it's not just a water issue, it's consumer products, it's food items. How do we deal with that? Mm -hmm. Just one last question. You mentioned that EPA is going to list a couple other contaminants, other PFAS uh, in the fall. Did you do that? They're going to try they... to propose toxicity. Numbers okay. Did they release which ones they're going to work on? So there is, uh, if you go back, I think two slides. So if we go back two slides, it's still slide share. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, oh. There we go. So PFHXA and PFBA are in draft form. So they will likely be finalizing those in the next few months, maybe early 2023, in which case they'd be putting out a health advisory or if they don't put out a health advisory, we would be evaluating data from across the state and other information to determine is it necessary for us to develop a GQS here in the state. Um, yeah, that's that sort of tricky thing where it's like, well, if we if the PFBA number is a thousand and at most we detect five at the highest concentration anywhere, it becomes a question of you're just making a regulatory rule for the sake of making a regulatory rule. It's not going to trigger any action mm -hmm. somewhere. Um, PFDA, PFHXS, PFNA, EPA is working on those. We haven't seen a draft yet, um, but ideally those will be coming out probably in the next year, probably 2023 is draft. But again, this is also 
it's still doing that whack-a-mole approach of one chemical at a time and there's more the centrist of the zpa just going to set a policy and come up with a class based approach because that takes it out of a lot of people's hands in some ways but this is also where epa and even some states that have done class-based approaches they take that approach of drinking water and they start applying it to other media it gets really tricky to use that same strategy so several of them are sort of trying to figure out how to deal with that we're hoping epa can at least recommend something so yeah for our department just sort of the state level now similar similar agency as epa right we're dealing with multiple media <clears throat> waste and that's the thing where we need to make sure we're going to have a class-based tool if there's going to be multiple tools which ones do we apply that work for us, but also, you know, like what happened in Maine, where they get application of biosolids from certain places. Well, we actually have a rule in New Hampshire, if you can't apply to the you can't apply it here. So that's not our issue to deal with. But that's again one of the issues where when certain states start coming up with rules and starts mucking with how things move across borders. And that also opens us up for like issues with interstate commerce and all so that can delay out these regulations. So it's trying to work carefully Thank you. Oh, you're, well, you're welcome to stick around here. Uh, uh, sure, I don't know if Oral had something. Oh, yeah, sorry, I'm just, yeah, no problem. Um, thanks for your presentation. That was really helpful. I was curious. I know when when New Hampshire developed the state MCLs, um, you and others did a really careful evaluation of the available scientific information that's out there. Um, and these EPA health advisories are much lower. Um, could you talk a little bit about what the differences are? Is it kind of the difference between an MCL and the, the practical components of that versus a health advisory? Was there new health information they considered that wasn't available when you all did your evaluation? Like, could you just talk about how they kind of looked at mostly the same information and landed at a lower number? Yeah, so historically with a lot of the states, including New Hampshire, that have looked at setting some sort of health value. So call it a health advisory, call it an MCL, call it an HEQS, health-based guidance value, pick an acronym. Um, with a lot of these, there's been a really strong hesitancy of using human studies as the mathematical basis of setting these numbers. So there's pros and cons to it. And up until the EPA's recent announcement, there was a lot of hesitancy of using these human studies. So a lot of the studies up till now have been based on animal studies that were extrapolated out to human relevant doses. And that's where you go back a couple more slides, but you don't have to, but going back some slides, there's a table that shows a range of doses for PFOS from several states versus where the EPA is now. And this is one thing is that the big difference here is EPA has decided it's changed its position and is now using those human studies. And that's one of the things that we're waiting to hear back from the science advisory board, right? And I'll use two acronyms. But that was one of the things that the science advisory board recommended that EPA needs to clarify and better support that selection, because that's something where a lot of states are looking at the same. Most of us have been operating on the assumption that these were not usable studies for that quantitative basis. Qualitatively, yes, the studies point to PFAS are not great for the immune system. They're doing wonky things. We're concerned. But there's a lot of other concerns about those studies that made a lot of risk assessors and toxicologists hesitant to apply them as a mathematical basis. Let me uh, get back to still live there, Stefan. Good. So uh, I'll be quick. We've got about um, 26 minutes. So uh, our response. So of course we 
we have been tracking all this ourselves. We uh, immediately um, put some information up on our city website uh, about um, this interim uh, health advisory. So if you go to the city's website for water, as that, we currently point to what um, the state has and look forward to pointing to the new website with better, better info. But you can see back in June, uh, the state came out with basically a lot of information that Jonathan shared with us about the fact that, you know, here in New Hampshire, we have sampled, we do have MCLs, all that basic stuff. So, so we are tracking it. Um, the, uh, the other aspects of PFAS here, of course, uh, peas, we have treatment. And, uh, you know, the good news there is we've treated over uh, 250, almost, almost 300 million gallons of water um, at, through our uh, filtration system. We still have non-detect, so we sample throughout the filters. We also sample what goes into the system, and we are still at non-detect of all the regulated compounds. We are starting to see um, PFBA, which is a short-chain compound. So this is what's expected and what our um, piloting said and what um, all the you know data on uh, filtration is that eventually you're going to see the short chains come through first. It's somewhat of an indicator of, of where you are as far as the life of the filter media. Um, and uh, in that, we are working uh, towards uh, you know, putting an order in and, and changing uh, some media out um, this winter. Um, as far as the Portsmouth system goes, um, we are, um, uh, these are the rolling uh, New Hampshire averages. So we're required to sample quarterly and then um, we average those. And as you can see, um, Madbury, just a, a, a one compound PFOA detected at two parts um, and then the two wells that have some PFOA, but um, well, four, um, essentially zero, that's an average of non-detects and some um, detections. Uh, but uh, the three wells we have in town have, have higher lo levels. Um, so what are we doing? We're currently working with a consultant to explore options and, and what would it take um, to treat those wells. So that's something that we will bring before council eventually as part of our capital improvement program. Um, the Collins and Green and uh, Portsmouth wells are in the, the Peas aquifer, so that's more of a discussion with the Air Force, uh, the Greenland well um, is ours. Um, but quick little snapshot, Al tracks this, but uh, this is the eight years of sampling. Um, so basically when you look at this, these are the four regulated compounds in New Hampshire. And we use this graph to see, are we seeing a trend? And basically um, you can see different analytic methods in years past, um, you know, the accuracy of what a lab testing results are um, is, is showing you a bit more of a scattershot of sampling whereby um, ever since uh, about 2020, it's more of a consistent um, and, but you can see levels that are going up and down. So this is, this is really what, what we've seen throughout. Um, uh, the same is, is true with the Collins well, um, you know, samples and uh, results that are up and down and also uh, the Greenland well itself too. So we track that and, and certainly if, if we were to see a real um, rising curve, um, that would be a bit more alarming on what to do with respect to response. But right now, you know, we've been sampling poorly and um, that's, that's our data on that. And uh, we, uh, you know, we'll continue to do that. Um, another thing that, um, Wanted to quickly, I know this sort of segue a bit of what uh, Jonathan said about um, this whole uh, burden or load or uh, the media that you're exposed to, to PFAS um, contaminants because it's everywhere. It's in our clothes. It's in um, you know carpets. It's in it's basically in the air. Um, so I track these things. This security wide field is actually a water system that way back when I presented in Colorado on our case study of contamination here, I was um, approached by uh, the water operator of this system because they had just gotten this detection and lo and behold, 
they progressed, you know, just a little bit behind us and all the uh, same thing, you know, uh, sampling, uh, filtering, response, it was also an air base. Um, and then also they eventually had the health studies and the blood testing that we had. So um, this report just came out. So I, I tracked some of this stuff just because um, out of interest, you know, what's up at the other sites um, that are dealing with this and have, you know, health studies as well. Um, they um, had a 318 adults, 28 children, 180 household were in the, uh, the study. They had blood and urine samples and that data is on there. And they also collected, so this is what caught my eye. They collected tap water and dust samples. So um, that sampling wasn't done um, for us. Well, we did have tap water samples here, um, but the dust samples was what caught my eye. And then uh, basically they sampled um, 18 of the properties um, in houses. So they basically went to the primary living space, um, the kitchen bedroom where um, the participants spent most of their time. Um, they also compared that data. So anytime you look at a study, there's always reference points of, are there other studies out there? Um, they, got, they pointed to a study that was done in Boston a number of years ago. Um, dust um, levels uh, were comparable, but uh, when you look at the results, it's it's quite, um, you know, the, the numbers are, are fairly, and these are in parts per billion. So they sampled for 30 different PFAS compounds and pretty much had a detection of, of all of them um, and some higher than others. Uh, PFAS was, was fairly high. Um, PFHXS um, had a maximum result of uh, 267. Um, the averages, when you look at the mean, were um, some not able to, to calculate and others, um, you know, mostly in the single digits when it, it came out. But, um, you know, I, I think it touches on a whole new realm of, of, of this overall exposure. I, I know and it's not to deflect what's in the water as far as being a, a public water system and the fact that, yes, we do have it. It's more that in our environment, you know, where is this stuff coming from? And where, if you find a part or two parts per trillion of a contaminant of PFAS, it's like, well, it, it, it's essentially, and I know we talk about it in landfills, but landfills over the years, you know, they accepted carpet, they were all kinds of stuff, used, used clothes, furniture, furniture, you know, Scott Guard was, was big and Scott Guard is uh, just full of PFAS. So, um, Basically, just just throwing it out there as 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 just you know other information, and and this will, will be something to um, you know continue to track as well. Do you want to continue the discussion? Yeah, I just have a. I know we asked all of our questions. I just have a couple of questions, Brian, for you about. Um, you talked about you guys are looking at or <clears throat> thinking about treatment on Portsmouth, Collins, and Greenland wells. Would so there be treatment on the wells, or would you treat at Madbury, or how how would some, what would that look like? We treat the wells, so the, the concept right now we're looking at consultants to figure out the best way to do this. But we're considering having Portsmouth and Collins wells combined to a single treatment facility, just because they are very close together. Um, we're still determining if that is feasible, piping wise, to get them together to be able to do that. And there is some area city on property near the Collins well that we'd be considering for that. So the, they're looking at that scenario. Greenland would be its own treatment system, right, adjacent to right. the existing building. And where the Portsmouth and Collins well are in the peas, the southern well field uh, related to peas, this needs to be considered to, if this you know progresses and it does need to be treated. Talking to the Air Force about reimbursing for that. Oh yeah, okay. up the And then the Greenland well, though that is near Copley landfill. No, what is the distance from that well? That would require a big study to be able to determine where that water would be coming from. There's so many, because in Greenland, there's no uh, sewage system, sure. so it's all septic in that area. So it would require quite a study to determine where the PFAS would come from. So, and, and really, okay. so for that well in particular, treatment needed to go on it, that would be on the city. Of course, yeah. there would be no, would it, would it even be looked at to see if it was linked to Copley? 
which I recognize is also overseas. Something we can talk to our consultants about, see if they recommend anything for, for doing further investigations, trying to determine which direction is coming from or something. Like that. Most likely not, most likely it's be as hard as we can. I mean, to get a, we get a rough estimate of what, two million potentially for that. So we're still- Yeah, it's at two to two and a half million dollars for the Greenland well. Okay. Uh, the port, the Collins Portsmouth would be a bit more because of the piping, the building, um, uh, at least double that, probably triple. But at least for those two, we have a polluter that we could talk to about paying for. Yeah, well, the state will be, has had some lawsuits. Currently, there is a lawsuit, I understand, the state um, suing the manufacturers. Yeah. Of this. So there may eventually be, so MTBE, um, there was a um, settlement um, for MTBE with, that now is part of the drinking water groundwater trust and we've been able to get some of that money for um, you know the protection of our lands and stuff which is great so I mean there may eventually be be that you know currently right now you know in the in the, the fact that we have detections but they're not above any limit so the Air Force I'm, I'm not speaking on their behalf but they would say well you haven't exceeded anything yet you know, they're still paying to do the sampling and all the exploration and um, assessment there. So certainly if we, if we hit a trigger point, yes, we would, okay. we would say to them, you know, pay for this. Yeah, and, and Dr. Patelli, are you aware of any um, resources for communities or is there talk at DES about like when if sales go in place, if they're much lower, we know a lot of water systems are gonna be affected and probably going to have to implement treatment. It's going to be costly for a lot of municipalities. Um, are you aware of any funding or resources that the state might be providing so, to communities that we like for the Greenland well? We don't have a responsible party. So right now, a lot of that money was a couple pots of money, but again, they're all tied to the current MCLs. And for the money that's coming from the legislature, that's really looking at maybe a two year timeline where we have that money and that it's probably going to get spent out because a lot of communities are looking at PFAS issues, but they're also looking at manganese exceedances because we dropped that number around the same time we also dropped arsenic. So there's a lot of public water systems are trying to grapple with multiple contaminants right, right now. Um, some of the federal money that's coming in, I know that's being used in all kinds of different ways. Again, uh, if you wanted to get a really good breakdown of state, federal, and other monies for PFAS-related issues. Amy Russo oversees a lot of that at DES. Um, and in addition to that, there's also the private well program that would be rebates for homeowners that if they have an exceedance of one of our standards, then they have a rebate program to help them with installing treatment on their house. So that's a pretty set program, but again, it's something the MCLs go down to two, it goes from being about oh, this many people to this many. Right, right. Okay. But well, glad that you guys have that. Sure. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Okay, so hidden copper. So that was going to be quick. Yeah, we can be really quick to this. Unfortunately, I hope that Kim will not be tonight. So we, I think uh, Hope was on. Yeah. Um, she's planning to give us a. Yeah, break. I'm still on. Oh, okay. I'm on. Good. Uh, so, just briefly, lead and copper sampling. I put this map together real quickly to see, to show you this, the spatial extent of all of our lead and copper sampling um, for the lead and copper, lead and copper rule. You'll notice all the, the sample locations are really in residential areas. There's a bunch of areas all of Lafayette. A lot of businesses aren't included in that. Yeah, so that's why you see the holes there. We have about 130 overall sites, and each year we are adding more to that. Next slide. Um, this is just an update. Uh, we finished our, our annual sampling for Portsmouth. This is a quarter three sampling, so July to, to September. Um, we finished it in uh, late and July. And similar to our previous results, we have a lot of non detects, 26 of the 30 sites that we sampled um, were non detect. Uh, 
two of them are less than two parts per billion, and two were between two and five parts per billion, which is typical of what we see every year. These, look at this, so the, the compliance for lead copper, as I talked about in February swag, is really based on system-wide evaluation, looking at the 90th percentile of the lead concentration. Um, and that action level is 15 parts per billion. So you take your, out of our 30 samples, 27 of those should be below 15. Um, and we are averaging around one. Um, quarter three, 2022, we also were one, which is also the detection limit of the analytical method. So we'll be doing 60 next year. Right? Next year. So part of, <laughs> since we, we've added well five, but in that very, Part of having a new well or a backup well or a replacement well triggers a resampling. So what resampling is is a full suite of samples, which for us enforcement is 60 samples to do that twice a year. So next year, starting right January, between January and July, we'll take 60 samples, and again from July to through December, we'll be taking another 60 samples. Yep. Congratulations! Thanks for getting that well online. Yeah, now you get the sample twice as yeah. many. So you know that three, four times, no, four times as many. It's good in that process. We'll be adding a lot more new sites since we're really trying to target more galvanized service lines now. And we've identified new ones, so we're trying to target those in our Want to skip that one? You just skip by, or I don't know if I want to get into this too much, but this is a, a point that I do want to make about this HP 1421. I hope I don't, I, I suspect you've been tuned into this as well. So, um, this was signed. Uh, by the governor on uh, July 8th. And what this does is reduces the allowable, acceptable lead limit for schools and childcare facilities from 15 to five parts per billion. So, so the New Hampshire DES had a requirement that 18, I think it was, for childcare facilities and schools to, to sample all of the areas and schools or facilities where children could be drinking water. Um, so that, that was done, but the case where numbers were less than 15, no actions were necessary. This now drops that down to five, so all the schools and childcare facilities need to reevaluate all this old data. Anything that's above five, there needs to, to be an action plan to remediate that. Um, and there's a 90 day period from when this was enacted to, to do that. Um, this is part of a longer term testing. So three rounds of tests must be completed before June 30th, 2024 on each of these facilities. That moves us on to the next topic here of potential for offering lead sampling free to customers through the system. I did get in touch with Sarah Jackazis, who was a grad student at UNH two years ago, three years, three years ago, maybe she was a, a, an, an intern, intern for us. Um, her master's project was working with a community water supply community, really offering free lead tests. And uh, part of the study was really to see what was the best way to get the word out I'll try to summarize. I do have a report of hers that we could potentially share with everybody if you're interested. We're looking at different ways to get, get the message out was through social media, word of mouth, uh, farmers markets, just to let people know that it's, you know, lead sampling was, was being offered. Um, the most from the most, uh, what got the most samples was uh, having kiosks out around the town where people could just pick up a bottle, fill up a bottle, and drop it back out to kiosks. Um, and that apparently worked fairly well for them. Some of the statistics, so they had 800 packets that they distributed in different places in town, farmers, markets, and such. And they had 142 samples actually returned from this. And this program was, uh, act in, was active for 26 days. So not a long period of time, but they were able to get 142 samples. They sampled them all at the UNH lab. Uh, was that just this past summer? This was 2000. And, I um, I'm sorry, uh, where was that? In Rochester. Um, some interesting statistics that came out of it. So of all these 142 samples, 67 of the participants were from public water supplies, 33% were from, on private wells. 68% uh, of these were had result, lead results less than one part per billion, which is great. 
and 3% had greater than 15 parts per trillion above the actual fractional. All of those that were above the 15 parts per, uh, parts per billion were from private wells. So this is a good combination of private and, and public um, sources. And, and it's interesting that the private wells, 30% of them were above five parts per billion. The public supply is only like 20% or less than one part per billion. So much lower uh, levels of public water system. Um, private well, which anticipate those wells are not usually treated for kind of pH control and such, and still have similar plumbing and houses. It's an interesting study, and this makes us think of I think this study would be hard for us to limit care unless we had dedicated staff doing it because there's a lot of uh, management, daily management of going out checking the kiosk and picking it up. Um, we brainstormed other ways of offering free lead sampling like having a having a uh, contract with a lab basically and having people that are interested can reach out to us and we just give them the information so they go pick the bottle fill it up send it back and basically someone else does all the leg work um but we end up paying for the sample as long as the methodology is correct to take the sample so just a just a thought that we've been putting out there that's something people want us to do uh, and I think just as a reminder, this kind of came about as a conversation after the February SWAG meeting where Beverly Drew and from New Hampshire DHHS presented on lead data and identified Portsmouth as an area where we have older housing stock. And even though it's not in our water, um, it, you know, potentially there could be connection lines or old faucets that could be contributing to lead or older homes or renovations are being done, things like that. So kind of looking I know, um, and this this will kind of help us, I think, segue to Hope. Um, we've had some follow-up conversations, Hope, Kim, and I, with New Hampshire DHHS to try to figure out collectively as a city. Beverly made some pretty clear recommendations to this as what what could we do to help identify lead elevated lead, lead levels, and what can we do to help you know detect lead in the community so we can prevent exposures to kids. Um, and so one thought came out was, could we offer a free lead uh, testing program to people who would want to, who would be willing to submit a sample to see if it's in their water. Again, not coming from the source, but potentially old process or something like that. And so Al was just reporting back to us on a, pro a, pro a pilot project that had happened in Rochester and what they found. And I, yeah, it's very interesting, actually. And I, I, I think I'd like to know more about like the costs. Um, like you said, it'd probably be easier to be the middle person, I guess. And would that be really costly? And then how many, it's interesting, they put out 800 packets, only 142 people. It's like, you know, how many people would actually participate if Portsmouth did offer a free pro program? Um, yeah, here's anybody else question. Your thoughts about that. No, the, the, the sampling we do is, is the required sampling. So this would be, you know, people that, you know, are just curious about their own, mm -hmm. own, uh, because there's quite a criteria that Al's gone through it in his other presentations. So um, this wouldn't be like the regulatory stuff. But again, you know, somebody doesn't know, they just moved into a house, you know, how old their plumbing is. It, 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 if there was a high protection, you know, I, we want to be we want to be informed of all the results from all this data. But then where does the liability land for following up with these people? Really important. So this, you know, it's part of our program, the health department or we can have to get involved in just mm -hmm. public service to, to find out. So just yeah. something we're gonna need to think about how yeah. we out. I think we can get back to the group with the cost and maybe put together a little pro forma of like, yeah. some way it would work. Yeah, because I think Beverly made some suggestions that I think are relevant to the swag. And then I think others are more relevant maybe to the schools and the city. Um, and so this is one that felt very relevant to the swag. And I wonder too, if, if it's, a, you know, obviously it'll be cost prohibitive, but even if it's, we could offer 200, free 200, the first 200 people to sign up or something like that. Um, because she did cite that there are, I think it was 49 kids in Portsmouth with elevated lead levels, 39 or 49, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it was a number that was concerning. And when you think about the cost of special education and the lifelong consequences because of that, you know, when we talk about cost benefit, we should, Try to do everything we can to identify where any lead exposures are in our community so we can prevent that from happening in the first place. And again, it's not coming from a water source, but just looking at it for a whole picture. And so with that, I think it'd be helpful to just turn it over to Hope 
who is a SWAG member and on the school board, and she can update the group on some of the efforts we've been doing kind of beyond the scope of the SWAG, but to try to bring more awareness and gather more information on this topic so we can keep progressing it along. Thanks. Thanks, Andrea. So I'm looking at the time. I've got about a minute. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll try to be quick. Um, we, won't, I, we won't bump you off. Don't worry. Okay. So um, as Andrea mentioned, this came about because of Beverly Druin's um, DHHS uh, presentation in February. And so uh, from a school board perspective, Beverly has already connected with um, Courtney over at the CTE program and looking at lead certifications as a potential program that could be adopted um, through the CTE. So I know they're starting those conversations, but um, drilling down, she put us in touch with Gail Geddens. And I think Gail, uh, she's at DHHS and heads up their lead health program. And Kim and Andrea and I had a very informative conversation with Gail about various initiatives that have already been done in the Seacoast area. Um, Gail has ran several lead trainings for um, Families First, as well as Fort Smith Pediatrics um, Association and some other organizations in the Seacoast area that the schools could potentially, we already do partner with some of them, but could uh, reach out and expand that partnership but there's already some um, training for lead testing that's that's available in our area that could be taken advantage of. Um, I think it's important to mention that Gil also educated us on the fact that um, they, DHHS has recently completed an 18 month contract with um, almost all of New Hampshire's public health networks, the greater Seacoast public health network being one of them. And that is to provide funding for lead exposure awareness and prevention activities. So, you know, as we're talking about funding and such, I think um, we'll be able to come back with more information around that. Uh, I think there, there will be some, some opportunities for funding. Um, one of the things that Gail mentioned to us from the school board perspective is that even if we could work this in as an opt-in program for lead testing to help bring about more data, because there's not a lot of state data on um, where lead numbers are with students right now. And the younger ages, um, nurses can basically count that as their CEU. So there's benefit, there's cost analysis benefits for you know, the school to, to look at building some of this in as an opt-in program. Um, one of the success stories they've had has been in Claremont, where Claremont not only basically implemented an opt-in program, but they also passed a school board policy um, for lead testing coming into the schools to help be able to collect more data on students, um, certainly helped their special ed programming and the cost around special ed and IEPs with uh, a lot of lead poisoning not being known to have some of the same symptoms as um, a lot of the other diagnoses that are being associated with IEPs. So um, there are cost analysis benefits for the schools to get involved. Um, in saying that, I think we have some education to do. There's a lot of opportunity to educate the public around lead poisoning and um, to the points around the state's regulations. Um, the July 24th child care program that was mentioned earlier around the water safety lead certification um, that, that's be, that has been passed and will be required by July 24th Gail is getting back with me on whether that also includes lead testing in the soils and in the buildings. And um, I don't know if you guys, anybody in the room has word on that, but I've, I've got that question out to her. Um, she said she believes that when it comes to the childcare programs, that, that the buildings and the soil will be a part of that lead safe certification requirement, but she's not hundred percent on that. So. Um, and I also have a call into um, Kenny around, you know, what we're looking at at the schools for lead soil uh, as well. Um, so
So our next steps really is recommendations. I mean, we came up, Kim, myself and Andrea had a good brainstorm with Gail of trainings, um, educational forums that can be done. She gave us a laundry list when you're thinking about uh, educating the public that other counties and other cities have gotten involved besides school nurses, but rotary clubs, commissions, Head Start programs, housing authorities, although it's interesting to see that the small amount of data that they do have really wasn't around problems in the housing authorities because there's so much regulations already there. It's really with private housing that's really the, the issue. So I think the more we can do around educating the public about the issues and um, the, better, the better we would be as a city. Um, I will just say that the next step for Andrea Kim and I is uh, speaking with Charlene Lovett. She's the mayor of Claremont. Um, Charlene is also running for legislation, but she's willing to give up her time to kind of give us some of the success stories uh, within that community in the Sullivan County, as well as the lessons learned. So talking about coming back with numbers and cost benefits, I think we could get some good ideas um, as examples of what things might cost from a lot of the work that they did. Um, and, and then the, I guess I, additionally, the one thing we wanted to bring up to SWAG is, and I have spoken to our new superintendent, Zach, um, Dr. Zach McLaughlin, he's certainly willing to come to the table, but I think um, it's Im imperative that he come to the table with other city officials around this, this initiative. Um, it's not really gonna be beneficial to just have the school board come around the table. We really need to have, you know, key players from the school departments come in as well as community members, as well as city officials coming around the table. Uh, just to kind of level the setting on the issue of lead exposure in the community and the impacts and costs. And the, you know, the more that we can have common people with common interests coming around the table that would be players in this issue um, come to one training, come to you know, one presentation, the bigger impact we're gonna have on the community to all play nice together <laughs> um, on the issue and, and actually I think get things done. So from the school board perspective, I've already raised it on the school board. They're certainly interested in having the presentation brought forward to them. They're certainly interested in learning more about the information and looking at it from a policy perspective from an opt-in, not a necessarily requirement. Um, and our superintendent certainly willing to give his time to come around to the table of other city officials. So Brian and Andrea and you guys in the room, maybe you can put your heads together and think about who who might need to be around for that early meeting. And then um, next steps in the school department would basically be based on that meeting, our superintendent then going back and, and kind of working things with the nurses and our um, wellness coordinator um, and CTE program and other players that could help move the needle. So did I miss anything, Andrea, that you can think of at this time? Well, thank you very much. Well, that was very comprehensive. And thank you for working on this issue and collaborating. I really appreciate it. Yeah. So I, I'm happy to update everyone or send out an update once we have the conversation with Charlene and kind of get an understanding of more around the cost and the process that Sullivan County and Claremont went through because they certainly have made more strides than anyone else um, besides maybe Rochester, which Gail gave us some really good grounded contacts uh, to speak with in Rochester as well. So I think between the two of them, we can learn a lot um, that will help us kind of expedite maybe our process. Great. Thank you very much. Hope. Sure. I think just the last, thank you guys for bearing with us. I know we're a little bit over time. Um, I think just the next slide, 
And I wonder, Brian, if we should just maybe try to do this more over email. Um, uh, I think I was going to suggest yeah. 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 No problem. Um, the last thing we just want to have a discussion around like the topics and goals. Um, and I think it'll probably just be best. We'll send out an email. Here's some of the things that were suggested or brainstormed in the past, but we're really looking for feedback from the swag on future topics. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know if we need to dive deep on that tonight. People are probably fried anyways. So um, does anyone have any final questions or closing thoughts? Um, and then if not, we just have to open it up to public comment if we have it. I would just say if anyone has any interest in being part of the calls with DHHS or um, Claremont, just ping me and I'm happy to, to make sure that you're part of the call. Thanks so much. All right, I think, and then do we have anyone from the public on? No. Just no. swag members? That's just okay. swag and so then there's no public comment. Wonderful note taker. All right, I think we're good. So next meeting is in November. Um, I think we have a few things to send out to you, that PFPRA report that just came out. Yeah. Um, and we'll put this up and we'll point to the new DS uh, PFAS information one side as well. And then yeah, look for an email with these subject suggested topics and then help give some feedback so we can guide future meetings. Great. And we'll see you in November. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks.